Welcome to Under One Roof's Doors Open Days event. The webinar will start shortly. For those who are joining us for the first time, Under One Roof is a free independent service that supports owner-occupiers, landlords, letting agents, factors, local authority housing officers, and others throughout the sector with issues around owning and maintaining a tenement flat in Scotland. Last year, through funding from Safe Deposit Scotland Charitable Trust, the Scottish Government, and local authorities throughout Scotland, Under One Roof attained charity status, which has enabled us to hire full-time staff dedicated to working with landlords and owner-occupiers of tenement flats and those that support them. In the coming months and years, Under One Roof will be increasing the information available on our website, our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram accounts, and through our monthly newsletter. We encourage you to share information we send out with those in your building or in your sector to help us improve the quality of tenement flats in Scotland. Today's webinar will last one hour with a short comfort break around the halfway mark. We encourage you to post your questions and comments into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. When asking a question, please provide your first name and a brief description of the issue you'd like to raise. If you'd like to appear on screen and ask your question directly, rather than have us read it out, please let us know. If we run out of time before your question is answered, please drop us an email with your question. Please note, the information provided in this webinar is designed to help you understand your rights and responsibilities and to understand what professionals tell you. Any technical information on repairs is designed to help you spot problems with your building and then understand quotations from builders so you can get the best job carried out for the best price. But every building and every group of owners is unique, and so are their problems, which is why the information presented in this webinar can only act as general guidance. It is not advice or a recommended course of action. When it comes to action, you should always seek professional help with anything more than a simple problem. More details and our legal disclaimer can be found in the About Us section of our website. Thanks for joining us. Let's begin. Hello and good evening. Welcome to our Doors Open Days event for Aberdeen. I'm Mike Kefron and I am the Chief Executive of Under One Roof Scotland. Uh, tonight's webinar will consist of a few short video presentations on tenement sustainability, followed by a discussion with a representative of Aberdeen's Home Energy, uh, Home Energy Northeast office. Um, first up, we have a video I recorded last month as part of our Edinburgh Traditional Buildings Festival using the Canongate uh, tenements off the Royal Mile as a backdrop. I, uh, I'll be talking about the importance of basic tenement maintenance and ensuring your tenement is sustainable. Uh, this video is followed by an interview I conducted with uh, homeowner Lisa Pascal, who has been retrofitting her flat to make it more energy efficient. Uh, Lisa is gonna go through some of the work she did to make her new home uh, warmer and drier and more energy efficient as a result. And the final presentation will be from Ewan Fisher, the Technical Director of Home Energy Scotland. We'll be talking about the support tenement owners in Scotland can receive from Home Energy Scotland to make their homes more energy efficient. And following that presentation, uh, Home Energy Scotland's Alison Campbell uh, will actually be joining us live uh, as part of the webinar to answer some of your questions on creating and funding a sustainable home. So with no further ado, uh, we'll get started with the first video. Thanks for joining us tonight and let's begin. We're now joined by Mike Heffron from charity Under One Roof. Under One Roof is set up specifically to provide detailed, independent and impartial advice on repairs and maintenance to tenement flat owners in Scotland, whether they are owner occupiers or landlords, as well as the factors and others that work with tenement owners. Hello, Mike, lovely to see you. The Under One Roof Scotland website is full of beautifully illustrated and articles and information, but can you tell us a little bit more about how important the tenements are and uh, the wider work that you do? Thanks, Hazel. If you live in a tenement flat where the cost of maintenance and repairs of your building is a responsibility you share with others in your stair, then you already know that the challenges that exist. Historic and older stone-built buildings are a beautiful part of our national cultural heritage, but that comes at a cost, and if vigilance is not maintained by those who are responsible for its upkeep, that cost can be heavy. And it's the maintenance and repair of these treasures that we live in that makes up such a large part of sustainability. For buildings to be sustainable, they first have to be kept standing. And when buildings aren't looked after, they crumble, 
and in some cases they collapse. That's why it's so important for tenement owners to work together to ensure the future of their building. Now, let's take one example of an issue faced by all owners in older tenements, keeping your building dry, looking at both the consequences for not doing so and actions that you can take to avoid those severe consequences. Now, to start with, and this may sound obvious, but it bears repeating, a dry building is a warm building. No matter how much insulation you put in, if the building is wet, it will remain cold. And the more spent to keep your home warm, the more carbon emissions increase and well, you know the rest. So what's one way to keep your old, beautiful tenement building dry and warm? Well, maintaining the gutters. This should be a priority for all tenement owners. Replacing loose slates on the roof is important, of course, but when there's a loose slate, the damp can be pretty localized. However, when gutters are blocked, water goes all the way down the building, which prevents the stone from drying. Now, here in Scotland, stone is always getting wet. But when gutters are blocked, the water is repeatedly pushed down the specific areas of the stone facing of the building. And when it can't dry, perhaps because the wrong kind of mortar has been used, the water comes out of the face of the stone. And when that happens, stone peels away, timbers rot, and the building starts to crumble. Eventually, serious repairs will be needed, and alongside those repairs, serious repair bills. There's even the possibility of damage so great that you could lose your home. The consequences of not managing things as simple as gutters is scary to hear, I know, but it doesn't have to be this way. Now, working together with owners in your building, you can draw up a plan to ensure this doesn't happen. Now, the first action you can take is to reach out to your owners in your building about setting a meeting to discuss maintenance and repair, both current needs and future ones. Ideally, you would want to form an owner's association, one that meets regularly and is set up so responsibilities are shared and don't fall on the shoulders of just yourself. Once you form such a group of some or all of the owners, you want to prioritize getting the building properly inspected by a competent surveyor. And if you're in a historic building, you should look for a surveyor with specialist skills in this field. Now, what you want is for them to identify what needs repaired and when and to give you a maintenance plan covering works needed yesterday and in years to come. Now, if you can't get owners to agree to a survey, which could cost maybe just a thousand or two thousand pounds between all the owners, then you can carry out your own DIY building survey and use this to convince owners that action is required. Now, the key things to look out for when doing the survey yourself are straining or clear cracks in the pipes, often visible by discoloration of the wall under the affected area caused by constant water leakage, an algae, moss, or any other kind of plant growth on the building. A clear sign that the stone is not drying out or where blockages may be occurring. Once you've identified that there's a problem that needs addressing, you'll need to report back to the other owners of the building, get contractors to quote against a proper specification, and then get a majority of owners to agree and pay their share. Now, I make that sound simple, but it's not. Um, however, it's not close to impossible either. Check out the free independent and expert advice uh, and information available from Under One Roof website, as well as our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts on how to take action on all of these steps and what to do if other owners won't agree to critical work. That website has plenty of resources to help with the ins and outs of finding and reaching out to owners, how to set up associations within your stair, and DIY building survey templates. Maintaining tenement housing is an action that each owner is responsible for, but you're not alone. Each and every person who owns a flat near stair has the same motivation to keep their building dry, warm, and well-maintained, and ultimately sustainable. Lisa, thanks for joining us. I was wondering if you could first tell us a little bit about your home. Right. So um, I have a, a one-bed tenement flat um, on the south side of Glasgow in Charlottes. Um, so it's a, a blonde sandstone tenement from 1901. Um, so very traditional layout um, with a hall off the main close. Um, I'm a ground floor position. Um, so I've got a big crawl space underneath um, with suspended timber floors. Um, and it's sort of traditional um, you know, bedroom facing the front of the house, living room facing the front, kitchen facing the back, bathroom facing the back. Um, you know, it's quite normally quite cozy. Um, but when I bought it, it was in it was in quite poor condition. Um, the the electrics had been written off, the heating had been written off. Um, it was a bit of a stroke of luck if I switched the heating on and it actually warmed the house. <laughs> um, um, but I did I did buy it specifically because it was a it was a DIY special. So, <laughs> um, 
so uh, it's quite a unique, um, generally t tenements in general are quite a unique, unique construction in, in Scotland. Um, so they're very specific to the, to the region um, and they've got some amazing kind of features to them. Um, so part of the appeal of this one um, was the fact that it had been so poorly maintained um, that a lot of the original features were actually there, they were just hidden. Um, so the, the original shutters were, were still there. Um, they'd just been nailed shut and covered over. Um, the original floors were still there. They'd just been covered over with a, a really cheap laminate. Um, so a lot of the really like good quality timber and, and features were there. They were just, they were just hidden away. Um, and ultimately, um, what I wanted to do was show how doing a low energy retrofit, um, would actually enhance the heritage look of a tenement, traditional tenement property. Um, that it, it's not about sticking styrofoam onto, onto houses. It's about doing a really sensitive retrofit, um, that preserves and even enhances the heritage features of the house. And yeah, that's, that's interesting you say that too, because you said that <laughs> it was almost secondary, the, um, the energy efficiency side of things too, but that was important as well. Yeah, so, so the primary aim of the retrofit, um, and this is, this is me being a bit of a, um, I, I like my warmth, <laughs> I do like being cold, um, that I, uh, the, the primary focus was really on making it a nice, warm, cozy home um, for me and my little spaniel um, that runs around the flat. Um, so I wanted a nice, warm, cozy home. Um, and to see how well I could do that as gently as possible, as sensitively as possible to the heritage of the building. Um, and the, the energy savings um, was really secondary because ultimately if I had heated this house as it was when I first bought it um, to a comfortable temperature, I, I would have bankrupted myself. Um, it was easily, my gas bills would have been a hundred pound a month minimum. Um, so, uh, the energy savings definitely was was a priority, but ultimately it was about getting that warmth in a way that was that was affordable and sensible. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the the methods that you use. There's various aspects that you um, you looked at and worked on, but mm -hmm. um, maybe if you could focus on two or three of those um, and talk a little bit about those. Yep. So, um, so one of the things with, with any tenement, um, so anyone that's lived in one, um, knows is they can be really drafty, <laughs> especially if you're in the ground floor. Um, so, so having, um, suspended timber floors, um, the, you know, their gaps between them, they are tongue and groove. So they, that does provide a bit of protection. Um, but I could stand in my in my kitchen the first couple of months that I lived here. Um, I, when the wind blew outside, my skirts kind of flew up. <laughs> it was uh, we jokingly referred to it as the Marilyn Monroe kitchen. <laughs> um, so it it had. Um, I mean, that said, it's that's a very well well ventilated crawl space, so that's good. That's healthy for the building. Um, but yeah, it unfortunately meant that my house was un un uncomfortably well ventilated. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to focus a lot on the floor because ultimately the only thing between me and freezing cold Glaswegian temperatures uh, was a bit of timber that thick um, in the floor. And that's that's a huge um, surface area in the building. So I focused a lot on firstly draft proofing the floor, sealing it up as best I possibly could, um, and then insulating it and protecting that insulation with, um, with a wind barrier on the underside. Um, and that made just miles of difference. Um, but the draft proofing meant um, some lots of fiddly work um, on the floor, on the edges, um, to basically close everything up well systemically and healthily for the building so that I didn't cause any unintended consequences. And if you could just talk a little bit about that, because with these own stone tenements, it's not a matter of just sealing them up, of course, because you need to let that stone breathe. Um, mm -hmm. That's incredibly important with these old with these old buildings, isn't it? Yeah. So, so what I've done um, is um, as part of sealing it up. So basically, what we want to do is make sure that the main um, those limestone walls, um, sandstone limestone walls, um, can uh, what we call breathe, which is um, it's not quite the right term for it. It's allowing the vapor to move in and out of the house um, through those walls because they do naturally kind of sweat um, and they allow water vapor through. So what I did was um, 
as part of the draft to complement the draft proofing um, because ultimately that's what provides fresh air in an in a traditional tenement is the fact that it's not draft proofed it's it's very leaky that's where all your fresh air comes from um so once you seal that off what you have to then do is provide per, put in purpose provided ventilation um so what i've got um at the moment i've got half um <laughs> i've got half an extract system because i'm still in a bit in progress um but i've got a mechanical extract system that basically constantly draws a very low level of of air out and it draws it out of the kitchen um, and out of the bathroom, um, draws it straight out. Um, and what that does is it just creates a continuous flow that's quite controlled, um, but it means that I don't have huge amounts of draft and I do still have um, fresh air coming in through um, through vents in the, in the window, trickle vents in the window. So I've got a constant kind of movement of air and that makes it a nice kind of fresh environment. So, so in the bathroom, um, I did do a small amount of wall insulation um, and internal wall insulation is uh, the only wall insulation you can do room by room. Um, so I did internal wall insulation, but I used a very specialist product um, that was lime based, uh, which allows um, water vapor, moisture vapor to move all the way through from the inside to the outside of the property. Um, that allows the wall to maintain a proper uh, vapor balance, moisture balance. Um, and the main purpose of doing that wasn't actually, in my case, to save masses amounts of energy, uh, though it turns out it has actually had that impact, um, <laughs> possibly just because I was cranking up the radiator to come and save the really cold bathroom. Um, but the main purpose of that was actually um, to take the cold surface away, the radiant effect of a cold masonry wall away um, so the actual amount of insulation i put on that wall was was relatively small um, so if you look at the overall kind of improvement in the in the u value of the wall it's not massive um, I've, i'm not you know taking it to to passive house levels or anything like that um, but ultimately the the big difference is the fact that that wall previously uh if you were to take a surface temperature it would have been in winter sitting at about 10 degrees um, with the heat cranked on full blast in the bathroom. Um, and now uh, if you take a surface temperature, um, it's sitting in a nice cozy 22. <laughs> Which, you know, uh, in the one room where you have to uh, inevitably take all your clothes off, that's what you want. <laughs> I wonder if you could talk a little bit about also the, I mean, part of sustainability is to be able to reuse material that was already there. Um, and it, you did some work on the shutters. Was that something that? Yeah. So, um, so again, part of the appeal of this house was the fact that, um, and, and sort of the seller didn't quite know what they were putting on the market, because um, the, the survey had come back, um, to be honest, a little bit worse than the house actually was. And this is where I, I quite lucked out um, having a bit of expertise in this. Um, so I, when I was kind of looking around, I, I noticed that, um, the what looked like the shutter boxes being sealed up um still had the you could still see the the hinges um and that's a hint that they're still under there somewhere um so the original features were still there they had just been covered up with like little sheets of mdf and stuff like that so they looked like they were completely blanked um and i thought oh i think this is i think all the original joinery is still here <laughs> <laughs> and that's a huge bonus because they did they did a number on this stuff um, in the 70s. They loved ripping it out and putting horrible things in its place. Um, so I was very excited at that and literally walked in the first day I got the keys with a with a wrecking bar and a bucket and that was all I had. <laughs> and, and started pulling things apart and sure enough, the shutters were there and I was like, yes, I got them. Um, and they were in good working order. So um, what I wanted to do... Um, was restore the shutters, uh, restore as much of the joinery as I possibly could um, to really make it look like a proper Victorian flat. Um, now the advantage of shutters from an energy saving perspective, um, and if you think of our, our big long Scottish winters up here, um, you know, the sun rises at like nine o'clock in the morning and sets at like three in the afternoon <laughs> in the dead of winter. Um, so you've got quite a lot of the day that's actually dark outside where you really don't have a view out the windows anyway. Um, and so when you close the shutters, you're not 
missing out on daylight or anything like that. In fact, you're getting some privacy um, because obviously when the lights are on inside and people are outside and it's dark, they can see in your house quite easily. Um, and being in a ground floor position, that was, that's a bit vulnerable for me. Um, so having these big, huge wooden shutters that can close, like they have quite a lot of privacy. Mine are very well fitted because they're the original ones. Um, so they close up nice and snug. Um, and what that does, um, is again, if you were to take the surface temperature of the glass in winter um, on a window that doesn't have a shutter in front of it, um, the surface temperature of that glass would be very, very cold. Um, and likewise, the surface temperature of the frame of the window would be quite cold. Um, so you're, you're cutting off that radiant effect of the coldness from that window. Um, from an energy perspective, energy saving perspective, again, you're cutting off any drafts from badly fitted windows. Um, so I do have um, at the moment, I, I haven't replaced my windows yet. Um, so they're, they're quite rubbish, 20 year old PVC windows. Um, but you close that shutter up and you've taken the draft away. You've taken the cold surface away. You've got a nice warm wood surface now that's that's in that wall. Um, the energy saving effect is quite significant and most importantly, the thermal retention and the comfort impact is very, very noticeable. Um, so on the days when I close my shutters, um, let's say I don't have to go into my living room for a day or two, I might close the shutters in the evening, you know, be out and about doing other things. Um, I'll, I'll always, um, I'm a bit absent-minded, always forget to turn off the TRV and the radiator. Um, and I don't have smart ones yet. So a few times I've come in, left the TRV on, and you know, two days after I closed the shutters, come in and my living room is sweltering. And <laughs> it's just held the heat in so well. Um, and that's that's absolutely brilliant, is the fact that you know that it's just it's containing all that wonderful heat. Um, and one thing that was uh that was interesting when I was doing the retrofit, so I got reclaimed cast iron radiators from uh Glasgow Architectural Salvage. Um and they're cast iron radiators. Um, you'll hear people call them inefficient. Um, they're not inefficient. They're actually very well suited to tenement buildings if it is well draft proofed. Um, but they are space inefficient, meaning you need a much bigger radiator for versus a, a steel one. Um, so usually you need a very big cast iron radiator, whereas for the same heat output as a, as a much smaller steel or aluminium one. Um, when I got my, my heating system changed over, the plumbers came around and they, they looked at the size of my radiators um, and I had sized everything, knowing I was going to draft proof the house, knowing I was going to insulate the floor, knowing I was going to insulate the bathroom. So I, I had in my calculations, I'd factored all this in, even though I hadn't done all the work yet. Um, and they looked at the size of my radiators and they said, you're going to freeze in this flat. They said, you need radiators twice that size. And I said, no, trust me, I do this for a living. <laughs> I was like, I will not need radiators twice as size. <laughs> um, and sure enough, I was right. <laughs> oh, Lisa, yeah. that's fascinating stuff. So no, it's really, it's, um, it's really interesting to see what you can do. I wanted just to, to thank you for, for going through that and uh, best of luck, because I know you're not done yet. So uh, best of luck with, with finishing it up. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, hopefully just, just basically one more room left to go and we're all done. <laughs> <laughs> well, best of luck with that. Thank you, Lisa. Okay. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Ewan Fisher and I manage the, one of the technical teams in Home Energy Scotland. Today, I'm just going to give a short presentation on the support available from Home Energy Scotland for people that live in tenement buildings. Now, just in case you've never heard of Home Energy Scotland before, we're a free advice service with a network of five local advice centres covering all of Scotland. We're funded by the Scottish Government and we're managed by the Energy Saving Trust. Our main aims really are to help householders reduce carbon and also try and tackle fuel poverty. And we do this through a range of different activities as well. So primarily this is through our advice team and I'll touch a little bit on this later, but we also attend events, and more recently, I think like everyone, we've been delivering more presentations like this online. And we do also have a specialist outreach team that can visit people in their home and provide more tailored advice depending on each individual circumstances. And again, I'll provide a little bit more information about this shortly as well.
Um, but each year as a network, we support over roughly 90,000 householders across Scotland as well. So in terms of how people engage with us, we, we do provide a range of support and advice throughout the network, depending on an individual's needs. So normally householders would contact us um, through our advice centre, and that's through a free, free phone number that's on the bottom of the slides. And uh, one of our skilled energy advisors would take the call and assess each individual's current needs and provide tailored advice based on their individual circumstances. Now we do cover a range of different topics, so it can be an, an initial call looking at general energy efficiency within the property. You may, for example, have a cold drafty tenement that you're living in and you're looking to find out about what advice there is around glazing perhaps or insulation. That's something that we can support with. We do also have more specialist teams, so we can adv provide advice on renewable technology. And also what we would class as hard to treat properties. So if you, if you are living in an older home, it's more difficult to insulate. It's maybe got, maybe listed, there's maybe some criteria restrictions around it. Um, we can provide more tailored advice depending on that as well. And also some more general stuff. So water efficiency, I know in Scotland, we always feel we've got an abundance of water because it rains a lot, but we can provide advice on how you can reduce your water demand, which can help you save money within the home as well. We can look at sustainable transport and potential funding that can be available for that. So whether that's looking at electric vehicles or perhaps looking at how you can use public transport more often. Again, that's an area that we, we can look at for you. And also very importantly, we can let you know about the support that's available through the Scottish Government. So generally that support can range from funding for general energy efficiency measures, such as insulation, potential upgrading certain heating systems. And we can also look at funding for other things to do with um, electric vehicles and things as well. So there's a wide range of, of different topics that we can cover. And what we try and do is hone in what's important to use the householder and based on your own individual circumstances as well. So as I touched on, we do also have a specialist advice service. So within each advice centre, we also have a team of specialist advisors who can discuss your property either over the phone or in person. Now this support it can be offered initially on a more basic level, which can just involve discussing different options and ways you can reduce your heat loss and improve efficiency in your property, perhaps over the phone. Or it may feel that you need a more advanced level of support with a property visit where we can come out and carry out an energy assessment and mono model the actual energy use of your current property as it stands. All the specialist advisors across the network have completed domestic energy assessor training and we can use this knowledge to provide you with a detailed report to outline the property in its current condition. So that lets you know, that looks at the current building fabric and gives you an idea of how energy efficient it currently is. Within the report, we're able to put together some scenarios that highlight different approaches that you can take to upgrading or improving this energy efficiency. And in addition to that, we can also help try and give you some ballpark figures to give you an idea of the estimated cost and also the carbon impact that these measures can have. So we can try and help outline what financial costs is associated one with installing them and also potential savings that they can make. And we can give you an idea of the impact on the environment from a carbon saving perspective. And just again to reiterate that this part of the service is completely free and impartial as well. So as, as well as providing um, advice on, on how for householders on making energy efficient improvements, so we know finding the right idea and knowing what to do can be certainly one barrier as people may perhaps just don't know how to improve the efficiency of the home or there could be challenges that they're not sure how to overcome. We're also aware that another barrier to this um, can also be cost. So we are, there are a range of different financial schemes on offer um, through Home Energy Scotland and funded by the Scottish Government with varying different eligibility requirements. And one of the schemes that I was going to mention today is the Home Energy Scotland loan. So the, through this funding programme, we have an interest free loan, again, funded through the Scottish Government and administered by the Energy Saving Trust. But as well as the interest free loan, we do also have an element of cashback where you can get a grant towards certain measures as well. I'll, I'll touch on this in a little bit more detail in the next slide, but it is designed to try and help cover some of the upfront costs and make these measures more affordable or through the interest free loan part, at least spread out the repayment of these. Now it does cover a range of different topics, so as you can see in the slide it says funding is available from renewables, which 
appreciate for this presentation today might not be as relevant, but it does also cover a range of energy efficiency improvements, such as internal or external wall insulation, um, certain heating system upgrades. You can also fund double glazing. So if you're going from if you've got existing single glazed windows, we can offer support through that scheme to upgrade to either double glazing or secondary glazing, depending on the preference. Um, and some more other measures such as loft insulation and room and roof, for example. Um, there's a lot of good useful information on our website about this scheme, and I've put a link for that just at the bottom of that slide. But in order to apply for this, the best thing to do is just to get in contact with Home Energy Scotland. One of our advisors will go over the different criteria with you in terms of the funding streams that we've got available. We can assess what options would be available to you yourself based on your own circumstances. And then if appropriate, we can make a referral for you to that correct scheme. Now, just looking at this in a little bit more detail, this is just a breakdown of just some of the measures that the funding is available. But I just wanted to provide an example of how the cashback would work linked in with the interest free loan. So I'll just pick out two measures. So starting with solid wall insulation. So if, for example, you're living in a tenement building, solid stone, and you're perhaps looking to do internal wall insulation, we have a pot of funding, a total of £10,000 that's available. You would be able to access £6,000 of that as a cashback grant that you wouldn't pay back. And the remaining £4,000 of that can be paid back through as an interest free loan. If the amount that you're borrowing is less than £5,000, normally the repay back term is over five years. But again, there's different terms and conditions that we can check and clarify for you in more detail if, if you're interested. Um, the other measure that I'd mentioned was, was glazing. So that's something that we get asked about a lot, is, is there any support for glazing? So if you've got existing single glaze windows, we can potentially support with that. So for double glazing or secondary glazing, we have a pot of funding of £4,500 and you can access £400 of that as a grant that you wouldn't pay back and the remaining £4,100 would be done as an interest-free loan. So there is some support there. And one last thing just to mention on this, within the terms and conditions for some of the more complex intrusive measures, there is also criteria just now about which installers you should use, just depending on what accreditation they have. So if you were looking at renewable technology, they would need to be certified through the micro generation certification scheme. And if you were looking at doing solid wall insulation, whether that's internal or external, just now the criteria advises that you use a Green Deal certified installer mainly because of the consumer protection that's in place through the accreditations. But, but I would stress the key thing there is that we would explain all this to you if you did want to give us a call. Um, so if you did want to learn more about the criteria, that's the sort of thing that we can provide advice on. So first of all, we've just looked at, um, we can help with the advice part of things. We can also look at what funding is available. But in addition to that, we, can, we do also have something available called the Green Homes Network. Now, this is an online network of householders that have been willing to provide case studies for other householders looking to install different measures. So these householders have installed a range of different technology. And if you have a look on, on the image on the slide that we've got, there is a, there's different filters that you can search by. So it just the example we've set up on this just now is if you put in your postcode and you type in, you could look to find solid wall insulation in a solid stone pre-1919 flat. That will bring up a list of the closest case studies we have to your property. The reason for that is there's different ways that you can engage with the network. So first of all, you can have a look at the case studies online on the Energy Saving Trust website, and the link for that is just on the bottom of the slide. We are also able to coordinate for you to actually speak to the householders that have made these improvements. So some of them have agreed to engage with people via the phone or email, and in some cases, we can also arrange for you to visit the properties. A little bit trickier just now with COVID, but it's something that we can look at for you. The real benefit to this type of thing, and the reason why we offer this, is that it can sometimes be really useful to learn about another householder's experience, about the process and the steps that they've went through. Um, they can tell you about the pros and cons of it, um, things that they would maybe do differently. So it's, it's not uncommon that a householder would say to us, you know, if I was installing X, Y, and Z, I would actually have done it 
in this num this process or would have installed this measure first, for example. So they can, the key thing with it is learning from other people's experience and generally householders that are on this network that have agreed to be case studies, they're very engaged and um, they're keen to sort of tell people about the measures that they've installed. It's not just to promote things just for the sake of it. So it's not just people saying, oh, you know, this is great, this is what we did. A lot of it is learning about things that would maybe do differently to try and make the next person's journey just a little bit more smoother. But this, this network, again, it's, it's managed by the Energy Saving Trust and each individual advice centre does, has a green, does have a Green Homes Network champion within the team and they're able to help coordinate and speak to members on the network as well. So I guess just to summarise those last few slides that we've covered, um, Home Energy Scotland can provide a range of support, um, starting with advice to assess the current energy efficiency of your property, help you identify what improvements could be made, we can look at the financial cost to these, whether that's looking at an install cost or savings, and we can let you know about the carbon impact of these as well through our specialist teams. And with that, we can provide a little bit more tailored advice, depending on what level of support you actually require. And we can also handhold you to access the funding that's available through the Scottish Government. So if you are looking to perhaps make some of the improvements that we suggested, we can explore with you what funding we have that might actually help get these measures over the line. And lastly, we've also got some case studies available, so you can at least learn from other people, especially, I think that's really key for some of the more disruptive measures, such as internal wall insulation, for example. And so hopefully that's been useful and it gives you a bit of an outline as to how Home Energy Scotland can support you. As I say, our phone number is on this slide, so if you did have any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch as we'd be happy to help. Um, but thank you very much and take care. Great. Well, that was uh, a video from Ewan Fisher from uh, Home Energy Scotland. Um, and he's the technical director of Home Energy Scotland. And uh, yeah, this, so there was obviously a, a lot of useful information there. And um, just to follow up on that, on the more um, practical stuff that can be done in your home, uh, I'm happy to uh, welcome Alison Campbell, who is an in-home specialist with Home Energy Scotland. Uh, Alison, uh, welcome for joining. Thanks for joining us for today. That, that's, that's my pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Great. Well, first of all, could you tell us just a little bit about what your role is with Home Energy Scotland? Sure. Um, so I am an in-home specialist advisor. Um, I'm one of a team of four specialists who provide um, a more in-depth service to uh, customers across the, the northeast of Scotland. Um, and primarily our service is face to face. So we uh, tend to be out on home visits quite a lot of the time. Not so much recently, but we are starting up again. Um, we've had to rely on a lot of telephone advice recently, but we're back out um, and visiting people in their homes. And the idea really is to support people who are interested in um, improving energy efficiency in their property or perhaps um, installing renewable technologies. Um, and I mean, it's, it's a great job because I get to spend a lot of time chatting through all of the different issues that people have in their properties um, go through very thoroughly um, um, from top to bottom, taking information about the property itself and also how people live in the property and what their concerns are about the property. And then we're able to provide um, the householder uh, with a, a tailored report. So um, providing information on where they are now in terms of efficiency um, and what they can potentially do to improve efficiency and make financial savings, hopefully, and then make carbon savings as well. So it's useful to quantify it in terms of uh, figures to help people decide on what they want to do to improve their properties. Um, and obviously the report also goes into information on where you can find financial support there. Because so we're giving recommendations and we're also directing people to um, where the funding um, can be accessed. So, so that's what I do to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, spend a lot of time visiting people and giving them advice. Well, that advice that you just mentioned uh, included sort of what are the, the, the things that people can do. And um, maybe you could run through a few of those things uh, for people um, yeah. today as far as the immediate impact that, that they could have. Yeah, yeah. so um, it may be measures that you can do yourself kind of on a DIY basis, um, because so many of the recommendations that are are there, maybe um, you need to have an installer um, to do that, and you maybe want to go through financial incentive schemes to, to access that. But there's so many things that you can do 
um, yourself, just on a, a really simple level, changing your light bulbs over to LED light bulbs. Um, that's it's you know uh, it may be about six pound per per bulb, um, and you could have the whole house changed over, and then immediately you're making savings. Um, and then I mean I was quite interested in Lisa's interview because she she <laughs> pinpointed so many of the issues and the solutions that that we deal with with our um, customers. Um, the draft proofing of properties, like I know so many people who get obsessed with drafts blowing through a keyhole <laughs> in the middle of winter. Um, drafts in kitchens where the pipes go through the wall and there's gaps and, and in the middle of winter that, you know, it can make the kitchen so cold. Um, and, you know, some of these things can be dealt with quite easily. If there's only a small gap around the pipe, then a little bit of sealant might solve that issue. If there's a bigger gap, um, expanded foam, expanding foam can be injected in it. Um, and then your keyhole, you can buy a little metal disc and attach it to the door and it covers that keyhole. Um, and even doors which lead out into a close can be quite drafty, particularly when people leave the front door or the back door wide open or if there's in the stairwell sometimes there's a window that doesn't close properly so you, you can get quite a lot of um you know air cold air blowing through the stairwell so if you put your hand on your front door and feel if the if the draft is blowing through then simple draft proofing strips around the door and and draft proofing brushes along the bottom of the door can stop that cold air blowing through your house um so um and that's in addition to what lisa talked about with the floors if you're on the ground floor flat you may well be getting um wind blowing up through those um those floorboards and lifting the carpet and, and all that kind of stuff so um you you know as as you mentioned um, you can insulate if you have access you can insulate underneath the floor but you can also use sealant around the skirting boards and and put sealant in between the the, the floorboards themselves um to stop those drafts um, so draft proofing can be quite, it can drive people mad <laughs> if you have drafts in the middle of winter. Um, the, the other, the other ideas are kind of reducing heat loss. So if you have a hot water cylinder in the property, making sure if it doesn't have much insulation around it, buying another jacket from a DIY store and, and, and insulating it further to try and reduce that heat loss. And then if the pipes, the hot water pipes aren't insulated, you can buy insulation, which just simply snaps on. Um, and then if you have any radiators which are mounted on external walls, um, radiator, reflective radiator panels can be um, stuck on in behind them to reflect the heat more into the room and less of the heat goes into the wall. Um, and I think that's a very simple thing to install because my mum managed it without asking for help. So I think these are these are some of these things are really simple and easy to do. Um, other ideas are around reducing your electricity consumption. So if you're needing to buy a new fridge freezer or washing machine or dishwasher, looking for the the most efficient one that you can you can afford is going to long term reduce your electricity consumption. Um, if you're in a top floor flat that actually has access to the loft, making sure that the loft is well insulated to, um, we recommend 300 millimeters depth of loft insulation. Um, and it's not always possible to, ha to get access to lofts. I know that some hatches are in the stairwell and quite often they can be locked and who knows who has the key. So could, there could be barriers to, getting that checked. Um, I know that some EPCs will say that there's no insulation in the loft, but it's assumed. And it could be that when the assessor, when the assessor was there, they maybe couldn't get access to that, that loft to check. So if you have a flat, a top floor flat, a flat, you will maybe want to check your energy performance certificate to see what it says in regards to the loft insulation depth um, and find out if you can actually get up and double check that it's that's correct, that the EPC is correct. Um, and if you aren't sure where to access your energy performance certificate, um, they are lodged on the Scottish EPC register, which you can find online and you can search for your EPC by postcode. So you should be able to download it if there's one there. Um, and then finally, one idea is uh, an aerator for a shower head. So 
um, a water efficient shower head that draws in air to mix with the water so that you use less hot water that those can be relatively cheap to buy and add on to a mixer shower I don't think they're appropriate for electric showers but for mixer showers they can be so those are a few ideas <laughs> to start with um, for people to have a think about uh, there's some really good stuff there um, I'm wondering if um either among those or actually other stuff that comes up particularly frequently when you're talking about the old stone, the old stone tenements. Is there are certain things that you come across or your colleagues come across time and time again, um, as far as sort of easy, quick impact fixes that can really make a dramatic difference to, to the bills, carbon reduction, all the things that are sort of wrapped up in this. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, other things relate to the, the, the actual heating systems as well. Mm -hmm so many um have the storage heaters um or older storage heaters um um which you know can be quite a, an expensive system to, to to use um and uh, you know and then changing over to mains gas is, is you know quite a costly thing to do as well but there is um you know there is uh, inter uh, financial help with that um you know the the home energy scotland loan scheme which was mentioned by ewan um it can provide um loan funding for upgrading heating systems so i mean usually it's the the issues people have is that they're finding it really expensive to heat the property and they can still feel cold even even when they are spending quite a lot on the the heating system um so it's it's you know essentially it's a lack of insulation and potentially older heating systems or expensive heating systems combined makes it makes them quite difficult to um afford to heat them adequately um you know and and the the obvious recommended improvements for an uninsulated wall is to insulate the wall but that is in a in a tenement your um you know, you're not necessarily always going to do external wall insulation unless the whole block is going to partake in it. So you're, we generally deal with our individual householders. So we are generally talking about internal insulation and then all the disruption that that, that entails as well. Um, and when someone is looking for funding, uh, and you're appointing an installer it's it's not likely that it would be done room by room in a kind of in a way that's um it, at your own leisure because the installer would probably want to get in and do the do the work in one go so it you know it, it is i think there's quite a lot of practical challenges for people who may want to improve energy efficiency um so one of the other things that came to mind was with with Aberdeen properties um more so than Dundee properties the top floor is often a room and a roof so there isn't necessarily a big loft space that you could insulate there's actually a property within the roof so insulating a room and a roof is far more um, complex than simply insulating a loft um so you know, I think specifically Aberdeen properties, they, they t so many of them have rooms in the roof. And some of them, rather than a loft, there's actually a big attic room, which is used for storage by the, the owners of the flats below. And again, that's more, that's also a bit of a challenge to insulate that area. So, there, you know, all sorts of challenges and to be dealt with by a collective of people it isn't just one person's responsibility it needs to be everyone which makes it you know a bit more of a challenge and has there been um any sort of a bit more of a focus on this or a bit more of an uptake due to the fact that there's such a with cop 26 coming up in just a just a couple of months now um and there's more people thinking about sustainability when it comes to two buildings um has there been sort of more of a have you been doing more has there been more of a focus on the sustainability side of things rather than just the mm -hmm. just the cost savings or are they sort of just mixed in together um i think there is probably more of an interest in um renewables certainly um that doesn't necessarily it's not necessarily relevant to the people who live in tenements 
because it's, it's so difficult to um, um, to, to, to figure out how renewables could be installed within blocks of individual owners. So, but but the the shift in, in generally and the people we deal with, yeah, I think people are not just looking at savings; they're looking at moving away from fossil fuels. They are also incentivized by the you know the, the financial incentives that are uh, in place through the Scottish government's Home Energy Scotland loan scheme. So there's there is um, there's a there's definitely much more interest and, and our service is in great demand at the moment, I would say, more so than ever before. <laughs> um, so it's all very good because people are very interested in shifting away from fossil fuels. Um, so, but it, it, but there's, um, yeah, there. I think there's a lot of different reasons for it. Um, but I think most people probably want to make sure that the system they're installing is going to cost less to run. <laughs> As well as make carbon savings, because it make it that's that would be the ultimate to make sure it ticks both boxes. Mm -hmm. Well, Alison, thanks very much for for joining us today. Um, it was really really um, helpful to hear sort of um, the very specific things that that people can do to make mm -hmm. their um, to make their homes and their tenements more um, energy efficient to save save money but also sort of to reduce carbon um given the sort of the focus that um we've got going on with sustainability both this year because of cop 26 but i think i think we're going to see that going forward so um so thanks very much for for joining us today and um, um and we encourage people of course to, to get in touch with home energy scotland if they've got further questions or they'd like an assessment to find mm -hmm. out more about the the funding as well mm -hmm. um and uh I'd like to thank um, all those who took part in the or joined us today for the Doors Open Day uh, webinar for Aberdeen. We have actually a couple more coming up. Um, you might even be uh, wanting to join those. Uh, Lisa will be joining us live um, this coming Monday um, to talk after her video plays to talk through a little bit about her personal experiences um, in um, doing retrofit work um, and energy efficient work for her. Uh, flat and that's for our Glasgow Tours Open Days um, and that's on Monday um, and then uh, later in the month I think a week on Thursday we've got uh, an architect uh, Douglas Campbell is going to be talking about that's for our Edinburgh Tours Open Days it's going to be talking about a, a retrofit uh, work that they did with a series of tenements um, in the Edinburgh area and it's going to be talking through that project as well. So we'd encourage you to uh, sign up for that. And um, or if you know people in Edinburgh that would be interested in that and live in tenements, um, uh, share the information with them and have them join us as well. So uh, so that's it for us. Uh, thanks, Allison. Thanks for everybody who uh, helped out with the videos um, that we were able to show uh, this year. And uh, we look forward to seeing you both next year at the next Aberdeen Doors Open Days and for the rest of the events that are going on in Aberdeen uh, over the rest uh, of this week uh, related or weekend or related to Doors Open Day. So thanks very much and have a good evening.